Issue 96 We start out with it being revealed that Dr. Quack's staff found Kodos unconscious outside his hospital, and he's inexplicably suffering from radiation poisoning too, which is affecting him both physically and mentally. And Jeffrey looks all annoyed with his arms crossed because Sonic got him there. Why are you acting like Sonic defeating an evil villain is a bad thing? Oh right, because you're jealous of him and know that he's better than you. You wanted to be the one who defeated him. This jealousy motivation would feel at least a little better if it was pointed out more, instead of being left just implied to be read between the lines. Sonic eating breakfast in front of his parents admits that he feels uncomfortable how they stare at him because he feels guilty that he can eat and they can't. I don't know why Robians couldn't just be redesigned to have mechanical digestive systems that run off the calories and sugar and stuff in food. Anything's possible with science in this world. For some reason, when Sonic plays dumb to Jeffrey asking how did he get here with no clarification on who he is, this is enough for Jeffrey to stop questioning him. Even after Sonic's mother puts her hand on his shoulder saying way to go son, which you'd think would give it away. Jeffrey then bitterly taunts Sonic about how Sally inexplicably hasn't contacted him yet despite not being mad at him anymore. Seriously, why doesn't she just call him? She can't call his home phone, really? Unless this is Jeffrey somehow preventing her from doing any of this, she is officially the most cluelessly incompetent girlfriend ever. If she wants him to come to her, then she shouldn't be expecting that in the first place. After we see Sonic defeating some robots in Eggman's base, we see Sally saying that she can't wait to go hang out with Sonic, making me wonder what's taking her so long. But when Jeffrey says that she might want to stay home because Kodos' allies might be lurking about, this causes Sally to say, how about when it's not so dangerous then? Fortunately, Sally then thinks to herself that this is a trip she has to make alone, showing that she's loyal enough to Sonic to at least try to start visiting him now. But seriously, how is Jeffrey higher rank than her? She should just order him as the princess to let her go see Sonic. Then we see Nate educating Bunny, Sonic, and Mina that different rings have different properties. Sonic gets past a note that has its third word being illegible, which sucks because that word is pretty important in the sentence. Then fortunately, instead of Nate scolding Sonic for passing notes like an antagonist would, we cut to Sonic learning that Mina wants him to help her learn how to control her super speed. Sonic asks her why she wouldn't just do everything really fast. That just reminds me of why he didn't take his own advice and defeat all the swap bots leading the Overlanders through Metropolis, or pick all those berries, or get the Fen Fan, in all just a few seconds. Unfortunately, Mina gets interrupted when Rotor shows up, and Sonic asks Rotor if Tails slept at Rotor and Antoine's house last night. First off, I didn't even know Antoine and Rotor shared a house together, let alone a house only themselves. Why isn't it Antoine and Bunny living together instead? And second, why would Sonic ever assume that Tails would go sleep in another house without telling him? And without him getting worried that Tails was mad at him because he didn't want to sleep in the same room as him all of a sudden. After Sonic finally gets worried about Tails being missing, some Shadow Swap Bots burst into the school, which logically would mean that Eggman found not whole already. More of a big deal should be made about this. Sure is inconvenient that the robot accidentally stumbled upon it that easily. This actually does get explained in this issue. For some reason, the tornado Sonic makes is red, which would only make sense if it was filled with his blood, but fortunately that's not the case. Mina wonders whether she did the right thing by leaving Sonic, but she should realize that he can handle himself. After Sonic and Nate get sent through the floor and fall down in front of Mina, with Nate being merely dizzy instead of horribly injured, Mina asks how she and her friends can help out, and Sonic tells her to get everybody outside. Bunny attacks the robot, and says that she doesn't know her own strength sometimes with a hole in the wall. And then Sonic, after assuming that Tails has been kidnapped by Eggman, hears a message from Uncle Chuck, as is made obvious by the text saying, Sunny Boy. That's a huge relief. Eggman really didn't find that hole. The message from Chuck tells Sonic about the situation with the Sword of Acorns, but unfortunately the robot gets destroyed by exploding arrows shot by Jeffrey, even though the robot was obviously giving Sonic a vital message. You idiot! And hey, Sonic says the exact same thing! You idiot! What have you done?! Jeffrey then shows that he's a bit of a coward, by instead of telling Sonic directly to stop bothering him, he tells Bunny to tell him that instead. And she obliges, because she doesn't want Sonic to get in trouble by continuing to provoke him. 
Mina, Bunny, and Grodor are told by Sonic's parents that Sonic's in no mood for company right now, and didn't even come out of his room for chili dogs. Now that's getting me suspicious. He's gotta have left that house then. Why wouldn't his parents just bring them to his room then? Mina says that it's been proven that Sonic was right about the Sword of Acorns restoring free will, and Sonic's mom confirms it to be true, even though if Jeffrey and his men had actually heard that part of the message, why did they attack the robot before it could finish saying its message? She says that it's up to Elliot to determine what happens next. More like Jeffrey. Then Sonic, actually reading through a law contract or something that he somehow found, finds a loophole and sees that while Sonic isn't allowed near the investigation, despite being the most important hero of the world, then Sonic won't go anywhere near it. And the story ends with Sonic having two chests for some reason. As I wonder what the hell is going to happen next. Is he going to get someone to go there? What's he talking about? Uh, so somehow I don't think he's actually found a proper loot hole. The second story starts out with pointless recap about stuff we already know. Partially justified by the fact that Merlin didn't know Tails was friends with Knuckles and what Knuckles' situation was. Merlin still refuses to let Tails help, saying protectively, Out of the question! I've already lost a brother! I won't lose his only son as well! So wait, if he's Amadeus' brother in particular, why doesn't Amadeus have any magical powers? Does Amadeus just suck at them and never uses them? Or is that, for some reason, only Merlin inherited them? Merlin then asks Athera angrily how many prophecies actually came true when he shepherded the clansmen. That makes sense if only because it turns out Knuckles wasn't the other guide to Albion after all. Broder was. Although technically he still was the other because they wouldn't have reached Robin if it weren't for him. So it was more like the prophecy was incomplete and there were two others. Athera explains that the problem isn't with the prophecies, it's with the interpreter. And his sin was the arrogance of a belief that he alone could protect his family from harm, but hadn't understood what part free will plays. Wait, so there's prophecies in this universe, but there's also free will? That doesn't make a lick of sense. How can there be both predetermined fate for everything, and everyone having the free will to do whatever they want? What keeps people in the confines of fate, then? Is fate just very selective and only applies to a few people? Then what prevents those few people from being stirred out destiny's path by the ones not affected by it? Then they hear Knuckles' disembodied voice calling out for his loved ones in confusion, and Merlin asks with pity where that voice is coming from. I felt pretty sorry for Knuckles when he thought that he was all alone. Wait, why did Knuckles teleport here? How did he know to come here? Through the power of plot convenience, that's where. Athera says that this is great news because there may be no better time to deal with Knuckles than when he's at his weakest. And after Tails wakes up, we cut straight to Tails being sent over to Knuckles in a spear of light, wearing a cape because I guess he thought it looked good for the moment. Tails says that he could help Knuckles find out where his family is, but unfortunately Knuckles gets all paranoid from sensing that someone else is near them. Merlin and Athera then show up, trying to reassure him, with Athera saying that they just thought Knuckles would rather deal with one person than all of them, appearing to him to make him trust him with honesty. Knuckles paranoidly insists that they're lying, which makes sense if you consider that not only was he badly inconvenienced by some people he trusted using a chaos siphon on him, but his own family has been keeping secrets from him his whole life, not to mention he's under a lot of stress from being in pain. Knuckles gets thrown down, being told that he can't tell a friend from foe right now, and Knuckles immediately decides to get into a fight with Tails because any mug who decks me sure ain't a friend. I can understand why he'd react that way then. But it's still Tails, you'd think he'd go easy on him. But with someone as violent and stressed out right now as Knuckles, I guess not. The first story was by Carl Bullers, and as Sonic got a message from his Uncle Chuck from a reprogrammed Shadow Swap bot, that unfortunately gets idiotically destroyed by Jeffrey before it could finish giving Sonic the message, when it should have been obvious to Jeffrey that he shouldn't have done that. Maybe he was just doing it to spite Sonic out of jealousy, and didn't actually think the message contained anything important after that. In fact, jealousy was his whole motivation this issue, as despite admitting respect for Sonic and shaking hands with him earlier, he has gone right back to his old ways. To the point where Sally seems forced to try to go visit Sonic alone without Jeffrey able to stop her. I'm confused that they didn't get the Sword of Acorns back though, or at least it wasn't made clear that they did, because Kodos had been defeated, and Arachna saved Sonic from them, so then where's the Sword of Acorns if Sonic didn't get it from her? The second story, by Ken Penders, has a whole bunch of talking with Merlin reaffirming his protectiveness of Tails, until finally, Knuckles and Tails start a fight with each other because Knuckles, in his state, doesn't trust anyone, which is annoying. 
I guess they're hoping that Tails fighting him will magically cure him of his stuff. I still don't understand how there could be both fate and free will. Those two are inherently contradictory concepts. If free will made some prophecies not come true according to Thayer, then why don't all of them not come true? Why doesn't every guy destined to do something get hit by a truck or something? 